Kumar and welcome to Back to the Bible radio broadcast. On today's program, Dr. Newfill continues his current series, The King Goes Public. As we conclude his message, The Servants of the King, our text for today is Matthew chapter 4 verses 18 to 22. Let us read it together. Let's read the scripture. While walking by the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, "Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men." Immediately they left their nets and followed him, and going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father. mending their nets and he called them immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him now let's get back to the bible with dr john newfeld dr newfeld you are known around the world for expositional bible teaching Could you tell us what that means and why it is so important to the believer? Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, expositional Bible teaching means that the Bible teacher actually has two jobs. The first is to understand the Bible as it was originally written, what it meant to the people that first heard it. So that is to understand the Bible in its historic context. The second job of the expositional preacher is to take that ancient book and apply it to our lives today, to help someone listening to know exactly what God is saying to them and how to apply it to their own lives. Thank you, Dr. John, and we will continue the series on The King Goes Public with the message called The Work of the Great King. After Jesus finished preaching in Peter's boat, he tells Peter to put out the boat into the lake and to let down the nets for a catch. And Peter says, "Look, we've been fishing all night, we've caught nothing." But because it is Jesus, he does it. And you know the story. He catches such a large amount of fish that his nets are breaking. He signals another boat to help and both boats are so filled with fish they're now in danger of sinking. When it's all done, Peter does an amazing thing. Having heard Jesus teach for the last year, having moved his business to Capernaum to be near Jesus, and having watched some of his miracles and now witnessing this miracle in which Jesus controlled the course of nature, directing fish to swim into his nets, he has something significant to say. He says, "Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man." This is an amazing moment. In effect, Simon gets it. I can't join the crowds anymore. I'm in fact morally and spiritually bankrupt. The more I've watched you and the more I've listened to what you have to say, the more I'm convinced of two things. You're a holy man and I'm a corrupt man. The difference between us is so vast, I will not perpetuate the illusion that I am your follower. I can't be your follower. My internal condition, the bent of my heart is evil. Please, please go away from me. And Jesus will have none of that. He simply tells Peter, "Don't be afraid." And then he adds, "From now on you'll be catching men." And with that Peter simply trusted him and abandoned his fishing practice along with Andrew his brother and became a full-time follower of Jesus. Now Matthew is recording this very same event but doesn't include any of that drama. His account is an abbreviated account. He simply has Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee, seeing the brothers fishing, calling them to follow him and telling them they're going to be fishers of men. No mention of the preaching he did on that day or the drama in the boat or Peter's crisis, none of that. But why? Why doesn't Matthew tell us the whole drama? See, one of the things you discover in reading the four eyewitness accounts of Jesus called the Gospels is that all four accounts mention the same thing, but they want the reader to see another layer of meaning behind the event. And Matthew, by not focusing on the great drama on the Sea of Galilee that day, or about Peter's personal crisis by removing this picture from us Matthew wants us not to get distracted but to see one picture only and what is it we're supposed to see see please remember that Matthew is writing to a largely Jewish audience and his audience would have picked this up in an instant what would they have seen 
Well, rabbis or philosophers or holy men of that day all had disciples. There's nothing unusual about a teacher having disciples or students or young men whom they were mentoring. But something is very different here, and any Jew would be left scratching their head. Because what happened here simply wouldn't have made sense to them. If you're growing up in the Jewish world at the time of Jesus, your education would have looked a little bit like ours, but different as well. From ages 6 through 12, all Jewish children, boys and girls, would attend a synagogue school. There they would learn to read and write, and they would memorize the sacred text of the Torah. That's why the Jews were among the most literate people on the earth, both men and women at the time of Jesus. At the end, Jewish boys would celebrate a bar mitzvah, which was their graduation from school, but also their introduction into manhood. They were now ready on the basis of their mastery of the law to live as men. From ages 13 to 15, young men who were deemed worthy were allowed to continue their education, and they would learn the entire Old Testament as well as learn their own family trade. Then after age 15, the elite of the Jewish young men would make an application to become the disciple of a well-known rabbi. It was an incredible honor for a rabbi to permit someone into his school. In effect, elite Jewish students created a resume and applied to various rabbis. If they had any chance to be chosen, they would show themselves to be excellent students. They would have to be bright. They would have to be worthy of that rabbi's effort. To be allowed into this kind of a school of discipleship was a great honor, and it also brought honor to one's family. The schooling would often last uh, between ages 15 and 30. They would literally follow the dust of their rabbi, or they would learn to emulate all their rabbi's mannerisms. They would eat the same food in the same way as their rabbi did. They would sleep the same way he did, going to bed and waking when he did. And they would learn the Torah in the same way as their rabbi did. And when they were fully trained, they would be like their rabbi in all things. Only then could they themselves become a rabbi. So you can imagine a 15-year-old exceptional student living in Galilee. He would be sending out application to various rabbis, hoping to be accepted by one of them. But did you notice who initiated the discipleship process? Well, the students did. Always the initiative lay with the young man. And now we know why Matthew doesn't mention the drama of the fishing boat in that day. He doesn't want his Jewish audience to be distracted. He wants them to see only one thing. Later on, Jesus would play on this theme. In John 15, verse 16, he would say, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. That's the one issue here. Jesus is not reacting to applications. He's leading, and he's choosing his men. Of course, Matthew's not done. He wants also at this time to tell of the calling of James and John, another two brothers, who were the sons of a man named Zebedee, a man, it would seem, who had a profitable business. When Mark mentions this event, he also mentions that Zebedee had servants, so it seems clear to me that Zebedee was able to carry on with his business after his two sons left and had followed Jesus. Furthermore, fishers in that time were generally wealthier than the average peasant living in Galilee, so we are to take from this that these men probably made a considerable sacrifice to follow Jesus. But that's not the point here. Only one thing matters to Matthew. Jesus called them. I know that only four are mentioned here, and that's not until Matthew 10, when Matthew will tell us all about 12 and how Jesus called them not just to be disciples, but to be apostles. But here in chapter 4, we have the calling of four. And of these four, we know that Peter, James, and John would become a part of Jesus' inner circle, the ones who spent the most time with Jesus alone. As tempting as it would be to make a sermon about the importance of following Jesus here and of abandoning every earthly thing to follow him, I will allow Matthew to make the point he wants us to make. When the king went public, he meticulously arranged his ministry in such a way that what he said and what he did and what he accomplished would never be forgotten. Jesus arranged it so that the gospel and his ministry would never be erased from the collective consciousness of the human race. And so he chose the men whom God had chosen to perform this task. 
And that, my dear friend, is why we can be so bold about proclaiming Jesus. One hymn writer said, kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. It's that name that will not pass away. It was entrusted to those who were faithful to carry it on. And that's why we need to fear no evil. That's why we need not fear the kingdoms of this world. They will all cease to be soon enough. But what was done in Christ will never be forgotten. In obedience to the Father, Jesus saw to that. He arranged it meticulously. He ordered all of it. Are you ever concerned about our country? You're concerned maybe that it's drifting further away from Christ. Whatever happens, let me assure you of this. But the word of Christ will not. Jesus saw to that. He made sure that it would always remain so you and I can get bold. Share Christ. We're on the winning side. The things that are proclaimed so loudly today will be forgotten by future generations. But what we believe when we hold to Christ will endure to eternity. That's the message that Jesus ensured on that day when he called those men to come and follow him. So let's be confident the gospel is for all times. Thank you, Dr. John, for that message. We really have been given a great gift and a privilege to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And I hope we have been able to do that today. Tomorrow, we will continue with our series, The King Goes Public, with the conclusion of The Servants of the King. Back to the Bible, leading people into a dynamic relationship with God. 